What? You want the routers to be able to forward traffic all the way through the network? Are you kidding me? In this video, I'd like to chat with you about how OSPF, from a high level perspective, how OSPF does its magic of figuring out how to forward packets. And to start, I'd like to introduce you to this topology. So in this topology for open shortest path first, I would like to acquaint you with the numbering system that we're gonna go ahead and use. Up here, we have area zero. Over here on the left, we have area one. And over here on the right, we have area two. And for the network addressing, we're using 10 as the first octet. And then following that, the second number is going to be the area number. So over here in area one, we would expect the networks to have in their second octet of their IP address, one, and over here in area two, a two, and in area zero, a zero. And then for the links between routers, like between R1 and R2, and R3 and R4, and R2 and R4, and R1 and R3, I'm just using the two router numbers there, from lower to higher. So this would be 12 in that third octet, and this would be 13 in the third octet, and this would be 24 between R2 and R4 in that third octet, and between R3 and R4 would be 34. And that logic continues down between all the other routers as well. So in this overview, let's talk about how OSPF does its work. Let's imagine that we've got R1 right here, and R1 has information about its directly connected networks. Or another way of thinking about that is the state of its links. And with its links, I'm referring to gig one zero, gig two zero, and gig zero zero. And so at the heart of OSPF is something called an L. SA. That's a link state advertisement. And one of those types of link state advertisements is created by each router. And regarding itself, that's always a, a great place to start. Let's start with ourselves. R1 would have a link state advertisement that talks all about it. So let's imagine that this is router one's link state advertisement. Now, inside of this information, this link state advertisement, R1 has three interfaces, three links. And so it would talk about, if we open up the details in that advertisement, it would have, okay, I've got information about network A, and network B and network C, and that would all be part of router one's LSA. Now, if we have 20 routers, we're gonna have 20 different router LSAs, these information from each of the routers with all the details in them. So perhaps this represents a collection of LSAs from the different routers. So if we took all these LSAs together, we could consider them like, uh, I don't know, some kind of a bigger database of LSAs. In fact, that's what we do call it. It's a link state database. So all the routers, learn and discover information about all the LSAs and they put them into a link state database. And why? It's so that they can take all the information regarding the network and then calculate the best path of how to forward a packet to any given network because they have all the data. But one of the problems is, is how, how does the information like get all collected? I mean, if router one knows about his LSAs, but how does he get the LSAs from the other routers and other devices on the network? And the answer is they share. And so with OSPF, what happens is OSPF uses little hello messages. And if you send out a hello, you're basically advertising your ID and that you're speaking OSPF and you're super happy about it. And if you see somebody else who is saying hellos on the same network segment, what can happen is these two devices can become friends and those friends are called neighbors, meaning they're neighbors on the same segment. And not only can they become neighbors, but they can also be considered fully adjacent. And here's what fully adjacent means. It means that these two routers are willing to share everything. It's like complete disclosure. I'm willing to share all my information with you. Let me give you an example. So let's imagine that you and I are router one. So we've got our collection of link state advertisements in this link state database. And each of those link state advertisements has details about the networks regarding a specific router. So we have all this information and then we start seeing these little hello messages between us, router one and router two. And they go something like this, hey, this little multicast message on the local segment. Hey, I'm a router running OSPF. So the short version is that after we see some hello messages, we can negotiate. And when we do that, we'll go ahead and compare our link state databases. So maybe this is what ours looks like. We got like one, two, three, four, five, six, six major elements with details in each one of those. And let's imagine that our neighbor says, uh, here's what I got. So what's this neighbor gonna do? This neighbor is going to ask and request updates so it can get the current database of all the LSAs for that area of the network. And router one's going to comply. It'll go ahead and send copies of all the LSA information that router two, for example, doesn't have. So it would look something like this. Burp, 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 burp. Boom. And then on router one and router two, the link state databases would be identical. They have the same information. And then router two can use all that data with all the link information to calculate its best paths from its perspective to forward traffic to anywhere on the network. 
So link state databases is a collection of the link state advertised information, and that's how information gets shared in OSPF. And I should also point out that if something changes, uh, let's say there's an LSA change that R1 becomes aware of either on his own router or learning an update from somebody else, what he'll do is he can communicate that update to his neighbors so that basically everybody is going to be up to date in just a few seconds because if there's a change, those changes get propagated through the network. And ideally, every single link state database in the area for each router is going to match. Now, one of the challenges is this. If we have to collect link state advertisements and put them in a link state database, and there's hundreds or thousands of routers, that is a whole bunch of data to have to grind through and calculate if we're ever trying to figure out our routing table. So instead of having to have every router get a copy of all the link state advertisements and put them in a huge link state database, we can carve the network up into smaller chunks. Think of it like instead of having a huge room where we have to memorize everybody else's name and get information from everybody else. Instead, we have, we have a smaller room, we can just memorize and learn the information for everybody in that smaller room, and that's less overhead. So there'll be less link state advertisements, our link state database will be smaller, and as a result, there'll be less overhead on the router. So in this topology, uh, we've identified that we have area zero here, area one here, and area two here. And let's go back just for a moment to the LSA on router one. So router one's LSA, which has information about his three networks that he's connected to, that LSA itself no longer has to go to every single other route in our entire topology. Instead, this LSA regarding R1 only has to be shared with other routers who are also in area zero. And this specific LSA for this router does not have to be sent down to area two, and it doesn't have to be sent down to area one. So from a visual perspective, it looks like this. So here's router one's LSA that has the information about the link states for gig zero, zero, gig two, zero, and gig one, zero. And that information is gonna be shared with R2, it's gonna be shared with R4, it's gonna be shared with R3, but those are the only four routers in that area. So router five doesn't ever have to get a copy of it, router seven doesn't, router six does not, router eight does not because the LSA for this router stays in the area. Sort of like the Vegas thing. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Now, there's one other question that when I was first learning OSPF, <laughs> maybe two and a half decades ago, but one of the questions I had was, well, uh, how, does, how does the information, like the router one's LSA with its link information, how does that find its way all the way down to a non-directly connected router? So in our topology, how does, how does R4 learn about R1's LSA? They're not directly connected neighbors. And the answer goes back to being willing to share. So if we have a neighbor that we are adjacent with and we're gonna become fully adjacent, we're gonna share everything. So if this is the neighbor that's adjacent and says, well, I don't have this LSA, something's wrong, we can share that over with that neighbor. So every router in an area is going to have identical LSA information in their link state databases. So the point I wanted to make is, it's not directly R1 in our topology. It's not directly R1 who's communicating over to R4 saying, here's my LSAs, it is R2 or R3 or both of them that are willing to share R1's LSA with R4 because they are neighbors with him. So the end result is that every router in an area is going to have exact copies of all the link state advertisements associated with that area and that's what makes up the link state database for that area. And there's just a couple more things I wanna share with you before we close out this overview and that is when I was first learning about OSPF, they said, okay, it's multicast traffic. And then I thought, well, multicast class D addresses where you send out a packet to a multicast address and a group of devices that are listening can receive that. But there's also the concept of multicast routing, which is way above and beyond the scope of what we're talking about with just multicasting to neighbors. So although OSPF uses multicast addresses, which we'll talk about more in a different video, um, that multicast is for the local segment only. So a multicast that's being sent from router one is not being routed around the network or anything else. Multicast with 224.0.0 anything are local. And so they're just meant for other devices on that immediate segment. And it's a mechanism that OSPF uses, but it's not using multicast routing. Where we're actually routing an individual packet over a multicast network. So it's just for the local segment for two neighbors to use that multicast to communicate with each other. And because I already brought up the concept of areas, I'd also like to introduce just a little teeny bit more on areas in this OSPF overview. And that is this, that networks belong to one area. So for example, this network right here between R6 and R8, 
that is associated with area two. The network between R4 and R6 is associated also with area two. Networks up here between R1 and R2 are gonna be associated with area zero. So it's, it's more appropriate or more accurate to say that networks are assigned to be in specific areas as opposed to a router because a router could have an interface in area zero and it could have an interface in area one. So each of the networks are gonna be in one and only one area, but a router could actually be connected to two or more areas. And when that happens, we have some special terms for those routers. So this is router four, which has three interfaces in area zero. It has one interface in area two. And this router has the ability to forward routing information between these two areas, this backbone area, area zero and area two. And that router with that capability is called an A, B, are an area border router. Think of it like a gateway between the backbone area and the area two. And the same thing is true over here for R3. It's also an ABR, an area border router, because it has some interfaces in the backbone area and it has another interface in area one. So it is an ABR between the backbone area, area zero and area one. So that's a high level overview to the concepts of OSPF. And as we continue on, we're gonna dig in in quite some detail regarding LSAs and how to view them and where they show up to make sure we're comfortable. And we'll also support this with labs. Now, if you are brand new to OSPF, meaning uh, I can barely spell it, <laughs> that's a joke. Um, if you're fairly new though to OSPF, I would invite you at CBT Nuggets as part of your subscription to go check out the OSPF sections in CCNA. That's the CCNA for 200-301. There's two sections. One is on the concepts, one's on implementation. They also have labs. And that'll help give you a really good foundation that you can build on as we continue to focus on OSPF at the professional level here. So I'll see you in the next video. Meanwhile, I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.